This is Norms Lab, a conversation on the impact of social norms on society and development in Nigeria. This podcast is brought to you by the Nigerian Learning Collaborative for Social Norms, a community of practice which aims to improve social norms programming and research in Nigeria. This community of practice addresses gender and social norms across multiple development sectors, including health and women's economic empowerment, through building sustained expertise and capacity of Nigerian organizations and institutions for good quality programming and strengthened networks. The collaborative is currently hosted by Selena Center for International Development and Research, CEDA, with support from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Welcome everyone to the first episode of Norms Lab. In this episode, Two social norms experts and I discuss what social norms are and how they affect development in Nigeria. My name is Nimi Sire and I am your host. Development initiatives are now factoring in the role social norms play in shaping attitudes and behaviors which inform actions, reactions, and interactions of people targeted by these interventions. This is because the outcome of these projects that address development issues is greatly affected by the knowledge and attitudes of individuals in the communities they are implemented. Listen on to know whom I am in conversation with today. A policy and gender specialist with years of experience in social and behavioral change communication to curb gender-based violence at the grassroots. Asbiala Ahmed is a leading voice in conversations that center social norms theory. Thank you for joining us today, Hasbiala. Thank you for having me. Our second speaker is Rihanna Ibrahim. Rihanna is a passionate and creative management consultant with a background in human medicine and surgery and core interest in system strengthening and innovative program design especially for projects relating to gender and broader human capital development. Rihanna is presently the project director of the Nigeria Learning Collaborative for Social Norms. Welcome, Rihanna. It's good to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Ms. Siri. Glad to be here. Now, let's dive right into the conversation. When people behave a certain way or make certain choices, they often attribute these behaviors and choices to social norms. Can you explain what social norms are, Hasbiala? Thank you for that very interesting question. Um, Social norms can simply be put um, as the way of life of people. Um, It's what shapes our ideas, um, the way we live, and it varies from gender to gender, and also it also varies from location to location. So if you can just simply put also social norms as that guiding principles. It's unspoken, it's not written, so it's just somewhere <laughs> embedded in our hearts that um, it's there. It's those rules that are there that we don't even know that they are there, basically. Thank you, Asbiala. So, Asbiala, Rihanna, do you remember when you first began to pay attention to social norms? and how these norms impact your day-to-day interactions and work? Absolutely. Um, I would say that my first interaction with social norms is pretty early. I mean, of course, at the time, I didn't know that they were called social norms. Um, but it came from you know, growing up in northern Nigeria. It was a diverse community. It was a university community, um, which meant that I had neighbors that came from India or that came from, you know, around my house. We had different ethnicities and different nationalities. Um, And I could see that, you know, different people had different unspoken rules as to how they live their lives, how the women um, navigated the world versus the children. Um, and But then more stark was living in Northern Nigeria um, and understanding the differences between that diverse university community, which was more liberal and progressive versus, you know, those neighboring communities where they were mostly Northern. Um, and we had a gardener, for example, whose child was I think 12 or 13 at the time and she got married and it didn't make sense to me I think I was maybe nine did you just say 13 
Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I was I was exposed to early marriage early enough, you know, um, and it kind of didn't make sense to me then. Um, and as I've continued to grow and um, understand the world, understanding that human beings are social beings um, and ultimately want to be part of a collective um, and would ultimately shape their lives around what they consider to be accepting, mm -hmm. um, you find that social norms is so predominant in a lot of the things that we do, a lot of what we call peer pressure mm -hmm. is, you know, around what is, what is acceptable um, within a social group and what might be punishment that we perceive is going to be measured on us for doing something or for not doing something. And you can apply that to so many things about our everyday lives and more so now in everything that we do in the public. Wow. Thank you. That's um yeah, that's quite interesting. <laughs> Not in a good way, the marriage thing. Oh, so Asbiala, could you tell us about your own first um interaction with social norms? I think I'm going to write with what Dr. Rayana has just um said. But for me, I uh, come from as early as social studies, um, where we were taught about the different cultures of people. Leveraging also or just going back to my another background and the whole early marriage thing i think it's something that um resonates with me properly and i also can remember um it being in secondary school jesus to jesus treat them when <laughs> when all that resonates around people your age is how to get married. I mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. couldn't comprehend honestly. Not quite how, a number of people yes, in secondary school. I remember I going to, for weddings mm -hmm. at Jesus to Jesus three weeks and I'm like, okay, why am I here? Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> part of friend I think but I honestly couldn't just um relate. And I know um, at that point, I even tried having to have conversations with um, some of my friends at that moment. And um, I was termed as probably being too exposed. Um, but at the same time, exposure for them is different from exposure for me. So at the same time, um, I, I couldn't just really cool their situation, but probably just better understand the reasons why their parents are probably putting them into early marriage. So it was for different reasons. Some were lack of financial assistance to further their education. Some were just basically the social norms that they are being aware of. They've seen their sisters get married early. So even if their parents, some of them actually had came from wealthy families, mm -hmm. but because they are used to that way of life, you couldn't mm -hmm. tell them any other thing. So, well, coming from my own path and my own background, I know that I can't dare come <laughs> to my dad and just three and say, okay, I want to get married. Be like, uh, yeah. So it, it, it's just something that I couldn't just comprehend, but at the same time, I think I just needed to understand different, um, yeah. different perspective and respect their choices and also respect mine. And I think summarily, a lot of what will people say mm, that yeah. people yeah. use to say, okay, what are people going to think about how I look or how I dress mm -hmm. or, you know, the fact that my child is not married or the fact that this person has been married and doesn't have a child yet. Everything basically around, okay, what are people going to think or what are people going to say are those things that ultimately tie back to those social norms that guide human behavior. Yeah. And it's very important to kind of appreciate that and center them as we continue to think of making progress as as a human race, yeah. <laughs> but more, more specifically as, as an LMIC or as, as sub-Saharan African countries. Thank you. So what I've gotten from your responses is that people experience social norms differently, yeah. um, mostly affected by their background, mm -hmm. and also what society thinks of people's behavior is um, kind of what ties them to these social norms. Thank you. Uh, a common social norm I also have seen play out uh, several times is um, the mutilation of girls and women in Nigeria. You have just shared um, child marriage as an example of social norms as well. So could you also share other experiences um, of social norms or other examples of social norms with us and 
if you know how these norms came to be, that would also be good to know as well, Rihanna. Thanks, uh, Nimisiri. I don't know about origins um, <laughs> because a lot of these norms maybe predate a lot of us and maybe even our parents and grandparents. Um, but I would say that there's tons of them. Um, and when we think about them now from where I'm sitting in, in as a development consultant, I see it manifest in almost everything that we do, as long as you're thinking about users in communities. Um, so for example, um, in the same Northern Nigeria, which is what I'm familiar with, that's, that's where I, I was raised and that's where I do my work. Um, it's a lot of gender related norms. Everything that we consider as within the patriarchal system um, ultimately come with a number of norms. Um, so everything from early marriage to um, harmful childbirth practices like home deliveries um, in many parts of northern Nigeria, a woman is considered the most powerful or the strongest if she's able to deliver alone, wow. you know, alone by herself with wow. no assistance whatsoever. And then she's higher than someone who was assisted by you know, her mother or a co-wife or someone. Um, and then that person is still better off than someone that required a trained birth attendant, whether it's traditional or local. Um, and ultimately, if you go to the hospital, you're considered, you know, what is wrong with you, you know. Um, and ultimately, people want to be seen or to be accepted amongst their peers. Yes, definitely. Um, we also see those norms appearing in labor and delivery. Um, and this is not just Northern Nigeria, this is maybe the entire country um, where people see um, cesarean sections as yeah. wrong or yeah. you know, people are stigmatized for things like that. And that's one of those consequences of social norms and how they might shape. We see things around nutrition and children not being given eggs because yeah. um, of some belief that they would steal yeah. um, that if you spoil a child you know i don't know how giving a child <laughs> eggs <laughs> amounts to spoiling them but you know you, you find it there but then there's also things around permission to work for mm -hmm. women permission for women to go out and seek health care for their children they, they most times require um some permission from their husbands and those ultimately cost a lot um in terms of individually for the women for communities at large and maybe even broadly for countries and economies as as we are seeing with all of our poor indices for development for example thank you so like there is hierarchy to how much women can suffer when it comes to childbirth yeah <laughs> yes i mean i mean i think that's from the health perspective at the same time again we shouldn't lose the fact that um, there are also beneficial social norms that have Absolutely. worked yeah um from the north to the east and just riding on the east where they have um the omogo practice mm -hmm. where yeah. even after a child yeah. but um the woman is being taken care of and even in the north she's been taken care of but she has 40 days where she just basically lounge mm -hmm. me to coming from my own omogo <laughs> <laughs> where you just lounge also um sometimes they are not beneficial and they are not harmful they are just there yeah they're a lot of yeah yeah yes they are and just there so um but i think these are things that people have believed in if i want to give you an example so when i give birth i had my mother-in-law come over and um, she was telling me things like, oh, in their family, they don't eat granules. And the, fa and the woman does that. So I really didn't understand. Mm -hmm. I was like, granules, really? I have, <laughs> I have roasted granules in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, breastfeeding and everything, you really want to eat on almost everything. Okay, it wasn't. It. So there are certain things that, oh, and I was really, as a social norms expert, I was really keen on. <laughs> To understand honestly, okay, why is there a nutritional allergy yeah, or something? Yeah. I know the family, no one is allergic to peanut or something. <laughs> Let me know what it is. Yeah. Let me and she couldn't really give me an answer. So I just understood that it's something that has also been transferred to her yeah. from her own mother-in-law. And I think she was glad really sharing it with me and everything. And she also mm -hmm. told me her own experience. So I mean, sometimes all not all social norms are. Bad. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. So many uh, non-governmental and civil society organizations around the world 
are starting to factor in how um, social norms impact their programs and projects. Um, Asbiala, can you tell me why this is the case? I think it's simply for success. Right. Yeah, I think we have, we well, social norms has been part of us as social beings, just like Dr. Rayana said. Um, since time immemorial, we can't get the origin of some social norms. In fact, I think some so social norms have probably metamorphosized mm -hmm. into what we have it now as. Um, um, but most NGOs um, and also civil society organizations are beginning to understand the importance of embedding social norms in their implementation and whatever they are doing. It's basically understanding the people that you're giving an intervention to. You need to understand the way you did their life, you need to know what works for them. And then even if you've realized that certain lifestyle doesn't work for them, you also have to devise a method and a strategy to be able to make it acceptable. So you can't do that if you don't understand. Yeah. If you don't understand their their, their life. So I think we, we we have realized how very important it is and how successful programs programs are when social norms is being embedded into their programming implementation and all of that. Thank you, Asbi. Um, is this also the experience for you, Ryan? Absolutely, um, <laughs> Nimi Siri. And I think that, I mean, just as she said, it's really about success and being able to move the needle and move it fast enough. Mm. So I would say that maybe traditional programming for years has um, most times been focused more on the supply side of things. Um, so using immunization, for example, um, you find that in the initial phases, people were focused on making sure that the vaccines are available and they, we have adequate storage facilities for them, that the health workers are at the health post where they need to be, that sessions are planned, you know, monitoring systems are put in place, supervision is going on to ensure quality and all of that. And, and we were doing some things around demand generation as well, but a lot of focus was around the supply side. Um, we were just basically doing broad communication on get vaccinated, yeah. get vaccinated. <laughs> um, and over years, we've seen that we haven't progressed to where we want to be. Um, and I think now everyone has realized that more needs to be done around demand. Mm. And a lot of that needs to think about behavior, right. needs to understand the influencers or drivers of behavior. Um, and you see that things around a caregiver and profiling her, understanding who she is, um, what her, who her reference groups are in terms of who make the decision um, within, within the context of where she lives and, and the world that she's navigating, understanding her pain points and what she's solving. A lot of times people are not trying to get their kids pricked just for them to cry for nothing right, right yeah um so even understanding the user and what they're solving but then also understanding all of those social cultural factors whether it's religion whether it's culture um and ultimately every guiding principle that influence their health seeking behavior um, has been well manifested and now we're seeing that that social behavioral change um, as it relates to norms, shifting norms or navigating around norms is kind of where, that's where the sweet spot is. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the area that we think needs to be fixed as we continue to build better health programs that is tailored to um, the, the users, right, or, or the communities as well. So basically, you can't really program for a people if you don't understand their behavior and what's absolutely, absolutely. Their behavior. Yeah. All right. And you can't do that also based on assumptions or what you think, you know. It has to really come from them and you have to kind of design with them, factoring in those norms. It is like using the participatory approach, basically, and including all the stakeholders to yeah. ensure that all the boxes are checked. Yeah. And that involves understanding the culture of the society which you want the intervention to, to be in. Thank you. As someone who has worked closely um, at grassroots level and directly with um, local communities, 
how have social norms affected your interactions and engagement as we are? It has affected my interactions and um, engagement greatly. Um, I think, aside from the passion side of it, just basically having to go out there, um, learn and unlearn some things, um, removing some assumptions that you had before without actually knowing some communities. Um, I think just basically the communication of like how their lives can be better yes. using social norms as a strategy. And then also understanding their perception. Mm. Do you understand? Yes. So it's so many things mm -hmm. lumped, mm -hmm. lumped into one. So it's just basically being there and being a humanist first. Yeah. I and believe I, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and just to add that, it definitely shows up. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, for instance, I'm, I'm a woman, right? And I need to be able to understand those gender norms. Um, while I may not agree with them, um, I need to be able to understand them and be conscious of them mm -hmm. as you think about implementing your work. Mm -hmm. So I know that I, I have to know what it means to be talking to a traditional leader. Yes. <laughs> I need to know, you know, what are the rules regarding can I go alone as a woman or right. do I need to go yes. with a man? Um, I need to know also as a man, you know, doing field work that you can't just stroll into a house yeah. without a female chaperone or you might not even get access to the house at all yes. you know so understanding just all of those pieces and even just even at a state level where it's not necessarily community or even at a national level you find that if you're the woman on the table there are there's certain certain <laughs> things that you have to be conscious of mm -hmm. and kind of navigate around even as you're delivering your message so that you know it's about the message and not the messenger mm -hmm. <laughs> many times so I, I think social norms definitely impact a lot of what we do but more importantly how mm -hmm. how we do yeah so my understanding of this is that understanding social norms as a development expert impacts your access to the community you are programming for. Like not understanding social norms might actually affect how the community would receive your message. All right. Thank you. So in your experience um, as a health care professional and a management consultant, do social norms significantly affect um, the implementation of health interventions and health care seeking behaviors, Rihanna? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, everything else that we've set up until now yeah. um, already kind of point to that. Yes. Um, social norms definitely, definitely affect human behavior broadly. Um, but specifically around health, right? So I would give an example of what is ultimately in Nigeria versus abroad, right? And those ultimately affect how Nigerians, uh, but more importantly, um, unempowered Nigerians um, navigate health, for example. So I'll give you an example. Abroad, you it's it might be a norm for people when they reach a certain age to buy a plot of land and say that this is where I want to be buried. Right, right. <laughs> um, or to put in a lot of money into their life insurance or mm. their health insurance. Yes. In Nigeria, if you buy a plot of land and say this is where I will be buried, <laughs> oh my God, are you trying to kill me? Um, and the same for health insurance, the yeah. same for immunization, because people will tell you, why do I have to put money away for some health care? Um, or why do I have to do preventive health care? I'm fine, yeah. right? Why do I have to vaccinate my kid? The kid is fine. Mm -hmm. The kid is growing. Mm -hmm. um, they're not sick, right? And I'm hungry. I'm starving. I have to go to the farm. I don't have time to go and queue in a health facility, right? Um, and so ultimately, you start to see how, um, what is the norm and what is the person's situation, may ultimately affect, first of all, their perception of a need for health services, but then also their overall behavior to, to seeking health. The same with everything I said around childbirth and delivery, because people will always say, you know, 
what is accepted what is my neighbor going to think what is my family going to think what are, what is the community going, going to, to think, think yeah. about this thing that i'm doing or what is what is just culturally or socially acceptable um here even even when it, it's not necessarily about logic most yeah. times it's it's really about those consequences that they fear mm. would ensue and some of that could be exclusion right. from social circles some of that could be inclusion in in certain punishments type things we have discussed how social norms impact um, projects especially health intervention projects so has be how did you come to realize that social norms impact or contribute to the challenges of the project you have implemented in the past and those you are implemented implementing right now thank you very much um for that question i'm going to start the i'm going to answer the question with a story and it goes uh, back some few years ago when i was supervising a team of um it seems it was an immunization um, project basically so I was supervising the team and we're going from house to house, door to know. If you're familiar with Kano, you know how how the mm-hmm. the the environment is. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to have a lot of caution, you have to know the community properly. And even with that, because we felt we, we were still having some hurdles, honestly. So there were some houses that it was just almost impossible to get mm-hmm. through to them. It's like when they know that we're coming, it's that they lock the door, wow. or the household head is sitting down, just waiting for you. <laughs> what are they scared of? <laughs> so, so we had to basically um, finish up, but then we strategize for those particular houses especially. Mm-hmm. And um, how we did that was basically to, uh, aside from the perception of the community that we the acceptance of the community that we were already aware of their perception, we had to further break it down to this household in particular, mm-hmm. or these households in particular, because they were more than one. And then that involved a lot of communication, education, dialogue, conversations, just basically being there. And like I said earlier, understanding their own perception. And what we realized was that um, it was just hearsay. Mm. basically that's so that so you can imagine them not accepting immunization for their kids was not based on some scientific facts it wasn't religious it wasn't cultural it was social just hearsay mm. so we had to break that down educate them go as far back as showing pictures and then um, even getting champions in the community that were now also helping to um be our champions, do you understand? Yeah. Uh-huh. To tell them that, oh, okay, this is it, this is it. We had to basically show before and after or what they will gain from having the immunization. So that's how we're able to basically break even with those particular um, set of households. Thank you. Wow. So it's challenging shifting norms. Um, have you or did you experience similar resistance while shifting norms, right? And how were you able to overcome these hurdles? Absolutely. Um, like I said before, the norms kind of influence everything around community level health or community decisions as it relates with health. I'll give another quick story or example. And, and, and I even knew this before my foray into like public health. Okay. Um, still right from clinical practice, you see a lot of children presenting with malnutrition, Mm. right? You see a five-year-old weighing less than what a one-year-old should weigh, for example. Um, You see some (laughs) one-year-olds having lost so much weight or not even gained any that they're failing to thrive and they're as tiny as a premature kid, you know? And you check and find that there's lots of breastfeeding practices Mm. that kind of affects those. You know, in medicine, you do a lot of history taking and a lot of physical examinations and you tend to uncover a lot of these norms and you find that those patterns are available or are kind of something you find in a specific subset of people, right? Um, so for instance, people believe you need to give a child water because the child is thirsty. That is a... It's a general norm, um, and that's it's a misconception that stems from the norm that you have to give 
the child water for the child to be okay, right? Or for the child to be normal. So we find from doing simple practical examples, like have the mother express the milk, keep the milk to sit for a while and just show them how much of that volume is water. Most times you find that 90% is water and you see the milk settle to the bottom, you know, so, so things like that, things like that are part of um, those things that contribute um, to, to all, some of those experiences where you see that norms are really what is shaping this and not yes. facts yes. or logic, yes. right? Um, and so those challenges continue to persist. Persists in immunization with non-compliance, like as B has mentioned, um, also shows up in nutrition, shows up in family planning. Um, a lot of people are very wary of contraceptives because it's just not the norm. So if you tell a new bride to try out um, contraception, it's kind of seen as um, a problem, right? Um, because she feels, she will feel ostracized. People will think she's infertile mm -hmm. um, and so many other things that she feels, right? Um, and was it, how were these challenges resolved? I think a lot of it is through educating and correcting what is wrong but also understanding where they're coming from and what they're solving. Like with genital mutilation or early marriage, for example, many of them assume or think that, you know, the child will be promiscuous mm -hmm. or the child, you know, will not have someone to marry her. When you check, these parents love their kids. These parents want their kids to have a better life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that unifies us all as a human collective, right? Um, but they are scared of some other risks that might affect their child's successful navigation or integration into society. Yeah. And so they continue to do these things, even though it's not their own wish or their own personal belief to do those things. So um, I would say that, you know, those are challenges that definitely show up every day in the work. Um, and resolving these challenges is by understanding where they're coming from, designing with them and having honest conversations and not coming from a place of I know it all, mm -hmm. from a messiah complex mm -hmm. um, and really just say, you know, what is it that you're solving and how can I help? Mm -hmm. um, and not insisting on sticking with the design that you had in your head or the assumptions that mm -hmm. you had preformed. Um, and also being open to changing things mm -hmm. every time as you go and tailoring. I think, I mean, also this, this shows up from clinical background, but also in public health is that individualized care or individualized interventions that what works for community A may not work for community B, even within the same local government, yeah. right? So I think a lot of that human-centered design, yeah. a lot of co-creation, a lot of... Um, dialogue, patience, and continuous mm. iteration um, is required to resolve those challenges. And of course, that's very, very daunting and it's, it's rigorous work yes. <laughs> every time. Yeah. Wow, it's, it's been such an interesting, educating, enlightening conversation. Thank you um, for your answer so far. Let's take a short break, catch our breath, then we'll return to continue this conversation. This is Norm's Lab. Welcome back to Norm's Lab. In what ways can listeners support positive social behavior change in their immediate environment and beyond? As Biala, Rana would also answer <laughs> this. <laughs> okay, um, I think interaction, engagement, okay. Okay. education, um, communication, and willingness to unlearn bad social. Um, norms okay. also the ability to relearn and also okay. just basically engage read research basically i think that's that just keep just be on top of everything social norms <laughs> okay yeah all right um right yeah so i mean i'll just build on that as well to say definitely on learning mm -hmm. okay um, on learning a lot of the things that you just accept as, oh, that's just the way it is. Mm. Um, whenever I'm in conversation or maybe on Twitter or on different spaces and people talk about, you know, that's just the way it is, I say, yeah. why? Yeah. You know, be able to interrogate the 
things that you just consider normal mm -hmm. um, and try to see if those things continue to contribute to the issues we have as societies. Mm -hmm. um, also coming with an open mind, mm -hmm. free of judgment yes. um, and understand your place of privilege. Mm -hmm. Because even as I understand communities and I do all of these things, trying to get them and all, I still know that I'm coming from a place of privilege. Mm -hmm. When I say a person should should not marry early or should be deliberate about having kids, I know that I'm saying that from a place of privilege, from yes. a place of choice yes. Um, yes. and autonomy that not everybody has. Yes. Um, so I think that a lot of our discourse is still based on, oh, oh my God, who are these people mm -hmm. doing this? Yeah. Or these people are too backward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you do not come at it from a place of curiosity to say, why? you know, why is this this way? How can we change this? What are they most concerned about? How can we allay that? And I find that that shows up in a lot of our development work mm -hmm. um, across different sectors. More people need to start coming from that place of empathy. Mm. Um, but I think also more people need to even know what social norms theories are yes. uh, and be familiar with how to incorporate it into programs. Mm. Um, and lastly, even in our social commentary, mm -hmm. in the way that we engage, mm -hmm. to be able to get people to come forward and be open to change, we need to leave room for that. Yes. And... Um, because it's social norms as well that yeah. people don't want to sound stupid or people yeah. don't want to feel embarrassed or feel attacked yes. by other people. Um, as, as I said, human beings, we're social as a people. So people will not share their problems and the real root causes if we're not coming to them with that open mind and free of judgment. Yeah, I think, Dr. Ray, even from we that probably time ourselves as being privileged, we still need to learn and unlearn Especially certain us. things. Especially us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we still need to learn and unlearn certain things. And yeah. then we, whether we like it or not, there are still some social norms that still find its way into our daily life. So just having to understand that, oh, I can actually do better. Mm -hmm. You understand? So Ryan has talked about unlearning and learning as um, a way of supporting positive social behavior change. What resources would you recommend that listeners check out to do this unlearning and learning and also learning about social norm theory as we are? I think I'd like to brag uh -huh. just for a bit. As the pioneer of um, the Nigerian Learning Collaborative and um, the, one of the biggest fans of the whole social norms theory yeah. concept. I think the social norms atlas is there. Okay. It has a lot of resources. It's a reserve of well, so many resources around, not just Africa, but across the world, right? And so I think that can be a good place to start from okay. because you have so many written works from oh. experts, okay. yeah? And then you can also compare and contrast countries. You can compare what's in Nigeria to what's in India to okay. what's in Uganda to what's in Kenya. So I think that's a good place to start in terms of resources. Okay. And then just conscious learning, research, communication on learning um, and relearning certain things is also, it's also very good. So for me, the easy go-to resource reserve well, will be the Social Norms Atlas. Where, where can we find, where can people find this social media platform? Yeah, Line Platform? Yes, yeah. the Line Platform. I was going to say yeah. the We will link the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the website uh, where you can find that resource. I think there's also um, this podcast, right. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, yeah. um, and different webinar series and um, social yes. media channels. Yes. Um, for social yes, models. I forgot the webinar like series. I think it's also a very good resource. Yeah. Yeah. On um, YouTube, I think they're all there on YouTube. Yes, so. they are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Hasbi. Brianna, mm -hmm. what are the three key things mm -hmm. you would like listeners <laughs> to remember on non shifting whenever they think of this conversation? Okay. I mean, I would want them to remember everything because I think <laughs> the stories and the examples ultimately. Um, give life to the conversation or yeah. help paint a better picture. 
Um, but ultimately, I want them to know what norms are. Okay. Um, and norms are those unspoken rules that guide how we as human beings navigate the world. Okay. Um, and most times, norms um, are accompanied by sanctions. Mm -hmm. Um, and those sanctions is a fear that something is going to be withdrawn mm -hmm. or, you know, there will be a punishment that is meted. Mm -hmm. um, some of that is either from the immediate reference groups or the community at large. Um, the second thing is that in everything that we do, norms always show up. Mm -hmm. um, but for the focus of this conversation in development work, um, or in any work that requires um, populations or community level um, interventions, norms have to be factored into everything that we do, including the conceptualization, not just the implementation, mm -hmm. the conceptualization, the design, um, the rollout, the implementation, and continuous monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, we always have to measure how norms are changing or how norms are affecting um, what we're doing and so incorporating norms shifting strategies um, or embedding social norms in all of the work that we do is critical um, and thirdly is that shifting norms is daunting yeah. um, <laughs> it's hard again. work um, but it's possible mm -hmm. um, and to be able to do that we need to collaborate we need to explore our users and their environments every time. And we can only do that through open curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we need to have more and more conversations yes. about these things. Um, and also understanding that representation matters. Yes. Um, and that overall coordination between all of the different actors is key. Everybody has to kind of contribute. Um, and whether or not you're in development space as a human being who yeah. is part of the human collective, yeah. it is critical that you are aware of social norms and that you navigate the world with them in mind. Okay. Thank you, Rai, um, for your answers. Thank you, Asby. In fact, thank you, Rai. Thank you, Asby. This has <laughs> been an awesome conversation and I am sure that our listeners are enlightened as I am right now. Um, thank you for speaking with me on this episode. Um, I hope that when next we want to have another conversation with you, you'll be here. Uh, all right. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you very much, Mr. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you for sticking around. If you like this episode of Norms Lab, spread the goodwill by sharing it with your friends and on social media. Tag us at NLC underscore social norms. Don't miss out on our upcoming episodes and series. Subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications button to know when a new episode drops. A keyword at the NLC is collaboration. Would you like to join our community of practice? Email us at info at nigerianlearningcollaborative.com to let us know. This episode of Norms Lab was brought to you by the Nigerian Learning Collaborative for Social Norms, a community of practice improving programming and research that address social norms in Nigeria with support from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Tune in again next month to listen to another phenomenal conversation on Norms Lab.